This was no ordinary death, no ordinary tomb, and no ordinary king. Deep beneath the cliffs of Egypt's Valley of the Kings, a forgotten chamber held a secret, one that was buried in linen and could rewrite everything we thought we knew about the Exodus. Six pillared room. For centuries, skeptics called it a myth, a fable told by desert wanderers. But what if the plagues were real? What if the firstborn did die and we have his remains? Manetho tells us that the Pharaoh of the Exodus was someone named Amenhotep. The story begins with a mummy covered in mysterious sores resting beside a lost prince. A story that may lead us to the Pharaoh who faced Moses himself. The discovery that changed everything. In the Valley of the Kings, surrounded by scorched cliffs and silence, a forgotten tomb lay untouched for centuries. In 1898, French Egyptologist Victor Lorette descended into its depths. The site was designated KV-35, and it would quickly become one of the most unsettling and profound finds in Egyptology. Within, scattered relics and signs of ancient looting suggested it had not been entirely undisturbed. But what Lorette discovered deeper inside changed everything. There, down a sloping corridor, past a shaft designed to deter tomb robbers, rested the undisturbed sarcophagus of Pharaoh Amenhotep II. Wrapped in linen, sealed with his name, the mummy lay exactly where it had been placed over 3,000 years ago. Unlike most royal remains, often relocated in antiquity to prevent desecration, Amenhotep had not been moved. His preservation in his original resting place was a historical rarity. Yet the most haunting revelation came not from his preservation, but from what came later, another mummy, smaller in size, buried nearby. This child was neither a servant nor a courtier. Inscriptions and artifacts would later reveal him as Webensinu, the pharaoh's son. But the discoveries didn't stop there. When researchers unwrapped Amenhotep's body, they found his skin covered in lesions, boil-like protrusions that no other pharaoh shared. These marks, so unique, would soon be compared to a biblical description. It was then that KV-35 stopped being just a tomb and became a riddle, one possibly entwined with the Exodus itself. The Plague of Boils and the Body of the King When G. Eliot Smith, the eminent anatomist of his time, examined the remains of Pharaoh Amenhotep II, he expected to find the usual signs of royal embalming, including resin-soaked linens and gold amulets, as well as perhaps some damage from tomb robbers. But what he found beneath the wrappings was something else entirely. Amenhotep's body was covered in rounded, swollen lesions that Smith called tubercles, raised boils unlike anything previously observed on Egyptian mummies. These lesions weren't just unusual, they were unprecedented. None of the other royal mummies unearthed from the Valley of the Kings bore these afflictions. They were not the product of poor preservation or environmental damage. They were specific, consistent, and most intriguingly, reminiscent of a specific passage in the Bible. Exodus 9.10 describes Moses casting ashes into the air, causing boils to break out on men and animals. Here lay a pharaoh, possibly from that exact period, his body marked by that very affliction. The finding raised eyebrows, then questions. Could this be the pharaoh who stood before Moses? Could these sores be evidence of the plague of boils? Meanwhile, beside him in the tomb lay the preserved body of a young boy. Royal insignia confirmed his identity as Webensenu, the king's son. His burial next to Amenhotep, within the same sealed chamber, would take on new meaning in light of Exodus's final and most devastating plague. The mystery was growing. The evidence was stacking. And KV-35 was now far more than a tomb. It was becoming a witness to the past a prince lost to the final plague. Webensenu was no ordinary child. Inscribed funerary statues and hieroglyphs inside KV-35 called him King's Son of His Body, marking him unmistakably as Pharaoh Amenhotep II's firstborn. He was wrapped in fine linens, his body preserved with the same care given to his father. But he never inherited the throne. He never ruled. He never lived long enough to wear the crown. Egyptian burial customs were strict. A royal tomb was sealed permanently upon the pharaoh's death, never to be opened again. That means Webensenu had to die before Amenhotep. His presence in KV-35 wasn't just a tragic family note. It was a chronological clue, a clue that matched precisely with one of the most chilling events described in the Bible. 
the tenth and final plague. According to Exodus 12, 29, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, the death of a crown prince. It was more than symbolism. It was devastation at the very heart of Egypt's power. Weben Senu was around 11 to 15 years old. His body bore the side lock of youth, a mark of royal lineage. Alongside him, a canopic jar bore his name, sealing his identity forever. Scholars argue over the cause of death, illness, accident, or epidemic. But the timeline, identity, and context paint a compelling picture. KV-35 doesn't just hold mummies. It holds a potential turning point in ancient history when divine judgment may have entered a king's house and taken his heir, the pharaoh who survived the sea. One major argument against Amenhotep II being the Exodus pharaoh is straightforward. The Bible states that pharaoh's army drowned. If so, how could his body be intact in KV-35? But that assumption overlooks a crucial detail. Exodus 14.28 states that the sea swallowed Pharaoh's chariots and army. It does not specifically mention Pharaoh himself. Kings rarely led from the front in such dangerous situations. In ancient Egypt, Pharaohs were considered living gods. Their deaths in battle would have destabilized not only the military but the spiritual order. Amenhotep, as a powerful ruler, likely sent his army ahead, watching from a distance. If his forces were wiped out and he returned in defeat, his humiliation may have been recorded only in oral tradition until now. Even if he had died in the water, Exodus 1430 suggests that his body would have washed ashore. Egypt's priests would have scrambled to recover the body of their divine king. Mummification was essential for his journey to the afterlife. No matter the cost, the pharaoh's remains had to be preserved. And that's exactly what we find his mummy still whole, buried with ceremony. Whether he drowned or not, his survival, or at least the retrieval of his body, aligns with both scripture and Egyptian belief. Sometimes, survival isn't about staying alive, it's about legacy. Amenhotep's remains may prove just that. Aligning the Biblical Clock The Bible gives a precise marker. According to 1 Kings 6.1, the Exodus occurred 480 years before Solomon began construction of the temple, which scholars date to around 966 BC. That places the Exodus around 1446 BC. Strikingly, Amenhotep II's reign, according to high chronology, begins around 1450 BC, almost a perfect match. That alone is enough to raise eyebrows. But it gets better. Moses, according to the biblical account, fled Egypt as a young man and lived in exile for 40 years until the pharaoh died. That means the pharaoh of Moses' youth must have had a long reign. Enter Thutmose III, Amenhotep's father, who ruled for 54 years, the longest reign of any pharaoh in the 18th dynasty. This timeline fits like puzzle pieces falling into place. Thutmose III, the powerful king, was the one Moses fled from. Amenhotep II, the stubborn ruler who faced the plagues, Skeptics argue that the 480 years is symbolic. But when Egyptian and biblical chronologies align this precisely, the weight of evidence becomes harder to ignore. It paints a picture of a real time, real rulers, and real events. No longer abstract theology, but documented history. It's rare for sacred texts and dynastic records to synchronize. When they do, it deserves attention, maybe even belief. Now first, like always, be sure to hit the like button down below. It helps us out tremendously with the reach of this video. Thank you. Why the Tomb Remains in Shadows Tutankhamun's tomb is world famous, swarming with tourists and media. But KV-35? Despite holding a pharaoh and his firstborn son, it remains in relative darkness, figuratively and literally. Access is restricted. Entry, even for researchers, is limited. Author and filmmaker Tim Mahoney had to negotiate persistently just to film inside the tomb. Why the secrecy? Theories abound. Officially, it's about preservation. But unofficially, many believe it's about what the tomb suggests. If Amenhotep II is the pharaoh of the Exodus and his son's remains confirm the death of a firstborn, then KV-35 bridges the Bible with history. That's controversial. It challenges academic consensus, which often leans against validating scripture. Egypt, a country with a tourism industry rooted in mystery and mythology, 
might prefer its ancient past to remain just that, mysterious. But archaeology doesn't always respect comfort zones. KV-35 contains not just mummies, but a narrative buried beneath centuries of denial. Royal seals, inscriptions, funerary objects, and bodily evidence. It's all there, not hidden, but avoided. If this tomb belonged to any other ruler, it would be hailed as a historical treasure. Instead, it waits quietly under the stone. History isn't always loud. Sometimes its greatest revelations lie in silence, in a sealed tomb, a forgotten boy, and a king whose story is still being written. The Science Behind the Plagues In 2010, geologists studying cave formations in Egypt noticed something extraordinary. Around 3,000 years ago, Egypt experienced a catastrophic climate shift marked by rising temperatures and severe droughts. The mighty Nile, once vibrant and central to life, became sluggish and muddy. This transformation could explain the first biblical plague, the Nile turning to blood. As the water slowed and warmed, it became a breeding ground for Oscillatoria rubescens also known as burgundy blood algae. It turns water red and releases toxins, killing fish and contaminating the river. This toxic bloom would force frogs to flee the water, crawling into homes and dying en masse, just as Exodus describes. Their absence would lead to an explosion of insects, lice, flies, and other pests, resulting in uncontrolled and spreading disease. In this context, the plagues unfold in a logical manner. Livestock, weakened by poor conditions and bitten by disease-carrying insects, die in droves. People begin developing boils. The sixth plague, once a divine mystery, now has a scientific path. This doesn't remove faith from the equation, it enhances it. Natural phenomena occurring in a biblical sequence at the exact right moment? That's either an uncanny chain of coincidence or a method through which divine will was expressed. Science doesn't always disprove miracles. Sometimes it reveals their mechanics. And in Egypt, that revelation starts with a red river. The mystery of the tenth plague. The final plague, the death of every firstborn, has long stood as the most supernatural of them all. But a new theory may offer a chillingly natural explanation. Returning to the beginning, the toxic algae that turned the Nile red also produce mycotoxins, chemicals that can seep into grain stores. These toxins remain deadly long after the bloom fades. In ancient Egypt, grain was sacred. It was currency, survival, and power. And the firstborn sons? They were the heirs. They ate first, ate the most, and labored in the fields. If tainted grain made its way into homes, it would be these sons who suffered most. Webensenu's early death now takes on even more weight. He wasn't just a boy who died before his time. He was a prince in the age of a climate catastrophe, surrounded by plague and poisoned food. His canopic jars, funeral wrappings, and burial location confirm his royal status and his premature end. It's possible he died not from mystery, but from mold. It sounds mundane, but in a land ruled by ritual and symbol, it would have felt like judgment. Whether seen through science or scripture, the impact is the same. The weight of loss, a grieving pharaoh, a nation on the edge of collapse. Parting the Sea – Miracle or Mechanics? The parting of the Red Sea has long been dismissed as fantasy until computer models offered a new perspective. In 2010, atmospheric scientist Carl Drews recreated a phenomenon called wind setdown. When strong winds blow over shallow water for extended periods, they can push the water aside, exposing dry land. Incredibly, this matches the biblical description almost perfectly. But it couldn't have been the Red Sea. That body of water is too wide, too deep. Instead, Drews turned his attention to Lake Tanis, a shallow lagoon in ancient Egypt's northeastern delta. In the right conditions, 63 mile or winds blowing from the east, water could have receded long enough for a mass crossing. When the wind stopped, the water would have surged back suddenly, trapping anyone in pursuit. The Israelites would survive. The Egyptians would not. Even the name supports this theory. The original Hebrew calls it the Sea of Reeds, not the Red Sea. A mistranslation centuries later changed its identity and popular belief. So was it magic or meteorology? Maybe both. What matters is that such an event could have happened. It's not beyond science. It's not beyond history. And perhaps that's what makes it powerful. Not that it's impossible, but that it's real. Between myth and memory. 
buried deep within KB-35 lies more than a mummy. It holds a question echoed through the centuries. What if the exodus had happened? Amenhotep II's body tells of unexplained lesions. His tomb contains the remains of a firstborn prince. The plagues align with natural disasters as supported by geological data. The sea's parting finds physics support. The timeline aligns with both the Bible and the Pharaoh's reign. This isn't about rewriting scripture into science fiction. It's about recognizing that legend and legacy may be the same. For too long, stories like Exodus have been dismissed as parables. But what if they're preserved in the very stone of Egypt's tomb? The convergence of faith and archaeology doesn't weaken belief, it validates it. It gives new weight to ancient words and new life to forgotten voices. Webin Senu's silence becomes a testimony. Amenhotep's mummified skin, a scroll of judgment. The story isn't just about plagues or miracles or escape. It's about a confrontation between divine justice and earthly power. A confrontation that left scars, some etched into scripture, others into flesh. KV-35 may not answer every question, but it dares us to ask better ones. Because sometimes, the truth lies not in choosing between history and myth, but in realizing they're both telling the same story. The story of Exodus is more than faith. It's memory carved in stone, sealed in tombs, and whispered through ancient air. KV-35 may not prove every verse, but it brings us closer to understanding a moment when power was humbled and a people walked free. Amenhotep II's body, Webin Senu's tragic demise, and the scientific echoes of the plague prompt us to view scripture not as myth, but as history remembered. Whether through belief, evidence, or both, this journey challenges us to look deeper. Because sometimes, the truth survives not in words, but in the silence of a sealed tomb.